really, it's really a pleasure. I think that this uh, lecture series, I have to admit that this is something which is maybe innovative, but which is really good as well for the, the development of the ISP to see as well the sustainability of the project and to see how our young uh, uh, students have managed uh, successfully as well to through their career, find some, uh, some uh, support as well from uh, what uh, they have learned through all our different lecturers. So it's nice as well that uh, we have as well some of our lecturers here. So thanks a lot, uh, Marco and Cathy, to also attend. And I think it will be very uh, enjoyable to listen to Justina's development as well after she has been uh, attending to our school in 2014. So then Justina, if you want to present your presentation, it would be wonderful. Can I go ahead? Can I go ahead now? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, please. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Um, I tried Justina. I'm a researcher, I'm also a lecturer at Convena University, Nigeria. It's a pleasure to be around today to take uh, this lecture. I'm, I attended ASP 2000. I'm from, sorry, I'm from Nigeria. This is the map of Nigeria. And this is, sorry about that. This is exactly where I came from, but I live somewhere here. I was born and brought up around this place, and that's where I stay even up to now. Like I said, I'm a lecturer. I'm also a researcher at Convena University. This is area B of my university, where I'm presently. I'm an alumnus of ASP 2014. This is a picture that we took then, some of the memories of ASP 2014 that we had then. Actually, um, I'm a physicist, but I have longed to be a medical doctor all along. And because of that, I didn't have, my education was not a straightforward one. Because in Nigeria, the way they arranged the undergraduate program, I actually wanted to be a medical doctor. And because of that, I stayed for some time at home, writing what we call JAM, it is called JAM in Nigeria. But eventually I was unable to meet up. I never dream at all of becoming a, a physicist, but along the line, I find myself at the end of the day when I was given admission, I was given physics. And initially I was like, physics, what do I want to do with it? I was not happy actually, but along the line, I said, let me take the course, let me see how it goes. So that's how I started the course. And after my first degree, actually when I started my first degree, unfortunately, I lost my dad the same month I was given admission to study medical physics. So it was a very tough one for me, going from undergraduate studies. But with the help of my mom and my elder siblings, I was able to finish my undergraduate at the physics. But along the line, I just have that mind that I don't need to change. Let me just continue and see what this course will offer me. But then I didn't, I didn't know anything. I didn't have any mind of so many things that physicists would do by then. And I finished my first degree and I proceeded for my second degree. And by the time I would go for my second degree, in my first degree, we did a little hour about physics, but I didn't hear anything about medical physics at all. And when I went for my second degree, 
actually wanted to do communication physics. That's why I made the choice of the university. I did my second degree. By the end of the day, I learned this while I saw the coordinator for communication physics was not around. And I was giving them, they call it head physics. I was like, wow, head physics? I've not heard about that before. What am I going to do with it? Actually, I thought of not continuing. But along the line, somebody advised me, why not continue and see what this course offer? So because of that, at the end of the day, I was able to do radiation and head physics for my second degree. Thereafter, I stayed for some time too before I started my PhD. So it was when I started my PhD, it was during my second degree that I got to know about a little about the application of um, physics that has to do with head, but not really medical physics. I was not aware of medical physics at all. But because I had that I wanted to be a medical doctor, so I was like, okay, the head radiation physics is somehow related to health and so on. So let me just let me just continue. So it was when I started my PhD that I got to know about medical physics. And by then it was not possible for me. And I want to also want to say at this point that I'm not a medical physicist, I'm a physicist. But my research, my PhD research was on diagnostic radiology. So that's why I was able to know a little. And I can say my research, most of my research is on medical physics and mainly on diagnostic, especially X-ray imaging. And that's why I'll be talking about actually imaging this afternoon. So as I was saying, when I started my PhD, that was when I got to know about medical physics. And a year after, I was also able to get to know about ASP. Actually, it was a former online who introduced me, and she's also one of my supervisors. This is the uh, my examiner of my uh, my PhD, and this is my the day I did my convocation. So that's how I got to know about ASP. ASP was a very a memorable time for me, and it really impacted me so much. And that's how I decided to show this view. After the ASP, that's how I got to know more about medical physics, the application of physics in medicine, particle physics, and so many other things. And I also met some wonderful people too along the line. That's why I decided to show this picture of um, Ame and I. First of all, we met at uh, ASP 2014, before at Dakar, before we now met at ICTP. And this is a picture of ICTP. Like I said, I decided to show this letter a part of it because I'm accrediting it to ASP as part of ASP in part in my life. And normally uh, they send the um, opportunities once in a while, I mean opportunities around ASP like LSP courses. And it was in the process that Professor Ketevi sent this. That's how I got to know about this uh, Association of African University Grants. I've not heard about it before now. So I applied for the first year when it was sent, I was not given. And then the following year too, because I was aware, I prepared and applied and this grant was given to me. So I'm acknowledging this grant to ASP. It's one of the impacts that ASP made in my life. And I really appreciate, I just want to appreciate everyone or the coordinators of ASP for this opportunity. And I want to say that it was a really very great one for me because my education, I never, I didn't have the opportunity to have a scholarship for my studies. I have to find my way around it. So when this one come, came in, it was a very big privilege for me because it's really helped my PhD research. So I'm saying a very big thank you to the organizers of ASP because it's first year of ASP, I was able to know about this AAU grant, and at the end, I was granted. So thank you very much for that. 
this is just a clip of ICTP that we attended the um, College of Medical Physics. I've been able to attend the program for two years now. I was there in 2018. I was also there in 2019. And I just want to say thank you to ASP committee for this uh, great uh, privilege and opportunity they have given. Now to my topic, radiation protection, diagnostic radiology. And before I continue, I want to say again that, like I said earlier on, that I'm not a medical physicist. It's only my research that is in medical physics. And one of the reasons why that is that even up to now in Nigeria, we don't have, we have medical physicists as courses in the university from second degree and even PhD level. But the certified one, which is talking about the clinical aspect, is not. So most of the people that are medical physicists in Nigeria are not, they are not clinically certified. And we don't even have that um, platform even up to now. So most people that will have that are certified, most of them did their studies abroad outside the country. So those are the few people we have. And up to now, it's still like that. So it was only my research, my PhD research that I decided to take in X-ray imaging. So like I said, my topic is radiation protection diagnostic radiology. Why are we talking about radiation protection? Radiation protection is the protection of people from harm, the effects of exposure to ionizing radiation, and it means for achieving this, according to IAEA 2016. From the electromagnetic spectrum. Hello, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. From the electromagnetic spectrum, we can see the range of uh, radiations. And we can see by the time we get to the X ray, we know it's capable of causing a breaking bones. And it can cause DNA damage. I'm still going to talk a little about that as I continue with the presentation. And like I said, also, most of my this is going to revolve around X-ray imaging. Now, I'm talking about X-ray. X rays and ionizing radiation. And because of that, it's capable of penetrating is capable of penetrating through matter and can cause DNA damage. This example of what X-ray can do when it's come in contact with matter. It causes a breakage to it causes breakage in DNA in DNA strand. And in the process of repairs, there is possibility of improper repair, which can cause cancer cells. So one of the danger that is associated with ionizing radiation generally is the induction of cancer cell. And though actually it's a low ionizing radiation, but yet you still have that uh, capability because of the energy range of X-ray to cause a cancer induction in. Now talking about the brief history of X-ray. X-ray was discovered in 1895 by William Coran Rutgen when he was working in his laboratory. And when we talk about X-ray, it has a very short wavelength and a very high frequency. The frequency, the wavelength range is between 10 raised to the power minus 11 to 10 raised to the power minus 8 meters, while the frequency is between 3 times 10 raised to the power 16 to 3 times 10 raised to the power 19 hertz. And the energy range is between 100 electron volts to 100 kilo electron volts. This is a sample of the first radiograph that was taken after the discovery of X-ray, and this is the 
the image of the wife of Rutinger that he took with the weights. The, of the wife, and this is the ring, this is a better view, that's why I decided to show this, this uh, picture. But this is the sample that was taken, and this is the first ever radiograph that was taken. And ever since then, X-ray has had has application in medicine, mostly in diagnostic uh, radiology. Like I said, why are we talking about radiation protection? This is an analogy of a patient exposed to X-ray imaging. This is a patient. By the time a patient is exposed to an X-ray imaging, about 98% of the dose of the radiation is absorbed by the body. And just about 2% is what transmitted through the patient and part of it is used, goes to the detector for the generation of the film or the image as the case may be. And that's to tell us how dangerous this exposure could be if one is what, because most of 98% of it is absorbed by the body. Just 2% is what goes out and just about 0.04% of it is even what is used in the generation of the, the image. These are examples of predation image, and these are some of what I work with in my research project. This is a CT image of the abdomen, of the abdomen. This is a mammogram. This is HSG. This is lower limb. This is CT of the head, the chest radiograph, and then this is a radiograph showing uh, the, uh, the cervical view. Also, these are some of the equipment I make use of during my PhD research. Actually, my PhD research was majorly on um, development of diagnostic reference level for Southwest Nigeria. These are some of the equipment. I made use of during my research, my PhD research. Talking of radiation exposure and X ray imaging, human being is exposed to radiation from different sources, and majority of it, about 82% of it, is due to natural radiation. And the remaining 18 is due to man-made radiation. And mostly out of this 18, about 16% of it is mainly due to um, X-ray imaging in medicine, while the other one is to operation and so on. But what I just want to bring up from this is that out of this, we find out that out of this 18% that is due to man-made radiation, 58% of it is due to medical X-ray. And from research, from literature, it can be found that about 3.6 billion diagnostic radio, uh, logical examination are being conducted annually. That's to tell you the number of people that have been exposed to radiation on an annually basis. It's a very huge sum that have been exposed to radiation. And that is the reason why we are talking about radiation protection, because so many people have been exposed and also, because of the danger that is associated with you, so there is need for the protection of patients. Now, just to let us know more about the exposure of patients to the impact of exposure, a single chest X-ray taken by an adult is equivalent to three days of natural exposure to radiation. And the effective dose from that is about 0.02. Now, if we go to CT, that is computer tomography, for an adult, a dose of a single 
a CT scan of the head is approximately 10 months of exposure to natural background radiation. And if top of newborn, we can see the number of years is more, the impact is more because of the, the age of the patient. And that's to tell you, and by the time we look at CT, um, CT chest, for an adult too, a single dose is approximately three years of exposure to natural background. That's to tell us the impact of this um, X-ray that we are talking about this afternoon. And if you look at the effective, the effective dose is the, is the biological effect. And we can see here that the effective dose from CT is very high. For CT, for an adult, the effective dose is about seven millisieverts compared to chest x-ray. This is just to show us, just to allow, to allow us to see how um, harmful this x-ray imaging, x-ray can be, and the exposure through medical use can be. Now, talking about radiation protection. Radiation protection has started as far back as 1902, after the discovery in 1895. So many people were exposed to radiation then. And because of that, as far back as then, about 100 milligrams per day was recommended. But we'll find out that, but due to increase in knowledge about the harmful effect of X-ray, this dose continue to be worked upon to be minimized. And that's why we're talking about uh, radiation protection. And in 1928, the International Commission on Radiological Protection and the National Council on Radiation Protection Measurements were formed in order to address the harmful effects and in order to minimize the radiation exposure due to patients. Also, the United Nations Scientific Committee on the, Atom on the Effect of Atomic Radiation was also inaugurated specifically to minimize, to reduce the half effect of the radiation due to patients. And in different countries and continent of the world, we have different bodies that are working on a daily basis, on a yearly basis, to make sure that the exposure of patients to radiation is reduced. Like in the United States, we have the nationwide examination uh, extent for x-ray. In the UK too, we have the head public of England that is responsible to monitor all this radiation exposed to patients on an annually basis. What are some of the principles associated with radiation protection? Sorry, we have justification of examination, optimization of procedure, and those limitations. I'll talk about this Alara principle later. When we talk of justification of examination, for any examination to be justified, the benefits must outweigh the risk associated with it. That is when the examination is said to be justified. And when we talk of optimization, optimization simply means the dose delivered to the patient must be as reasonably, as low, as readily achievable. And that is part of the concept of ALARA. ALARA principle is just simply as low as readily achievable. Now talking about those limitations, those elimination, for example, in diagnostic radiology, is difficult to really ascertain that less limited dose, because we are not only after the dose, but the diagnostic information that must be generated from it must be the one that will give us the, the goal 
for undertaking the examination. And that is why it is very, very difficult to do a dose limitation. But rather, what is being uh, in practice is to make sure that the dose that is given to the patient must give a reasonable diagnostic information that will be able to discover the reason for undertaking the examination. Now, talking about the ALARA principle, some of the principle that need to be involved when we are talking about ALARA principle is that the practice adopted must produce a net benefit. That means the benefit must outweigh the risk associated with it. And for that to happen, the dose must be as low as possible low as possible and it has to do with what the economic and even the social factor must also be taken into account when they are talking out of being low as low as possible they must not so because the dose must be as low as possible and they will just decide to just conduct an examination that will not be able to get a good information diagnostic information at the end of the day but all this must be put into place and that is why several other a factor must be considered in the process for this to be achievable, like quality control and quality assurance, those audits, and so on and so forth. All this must be put into place in order to consider the economic and social factor in the process, in the process of making sure that the dose is as low as possible. Also, it's also important that the dose that is also delivered to patients must not exceed the recommended limit. And that is why we are, we'll be to, I'll be talking about those uh, diagnostic reference level, even as, we, as I continue with the lecture. Like I said, there are some of the things that must be considered when we are talking of uh, radiation protection of patients that this regularly. We talk about the quality control, and also talk of the quality assurance. The quality control is talking about the periodic evaluation of the procedures. There are several and numerous procedures that are involved in X-ray imaging. And even with the advancement in technology, even other new modalities are coming up on a regular basis. And that is why the evaluation of procedure is very, very important. For example, in developing countries, in UK, US and so on, quality control, quality assurance are conducted. It's a tradition that they conduct on a regular basis. And even a survey is being conducted to make sure that all these procedures are being audited to make sure that a low dose is, is what is delivered to the patient. Now, talking about the quality assurance, the quality assurance is all encompassing. It involves the equipment, the patient, the procedure, the techniques, everything. They are all involved in uh, quality assurance. According to the IAEA, quality assurance is defined as an organized effort by the staff operating a facility to ensure that the diagnostic images produced by the facility are sufficiently of high quality to provide adequate diagnostic information at the lowest possible dose and even exposure to the patient. Now, looking about the biological effect of X-ray. X-ray has a low linear energy transfer and the relative biological effectiveness is about one kilo electron volt per micrometer, and the oxygen enhancement ratio is between two and three. Now, if you look at the survival curve for X-ray, we can see it is a curved, and that's to tell us that the exposure to X-ray, X-ray, the interaction of X-ray with the tissue or cell is not direct, but it's an indirect way. It is the X-ray interacts with tissue and cell indirectly. And that is why you can see that the survival curve is, uh, 
is a uh, is called for actually. Now talking about the impact, the risk associated with it. There are so many debates about the linear, uh, uh, the linear transfer uh, ratio. It's talking about that, about radiation at low dose. Some school of thoughts believe that when the dose is low, that the impact is negligible. But that is not true. Because we find out that today there are some computer tomography examination that the dose associated with it is very, very high. Compared to when you're talking of a radiography examinations or mammogram. But in computer tomography examination, the dose can be quite high. That is possible of causing a harmful effect to the patient. And from here, talking about the excess cancer risk, it was believed that before the impact can be more, the dose must be above 100 millisieverts. And that is why this arrow is being uh, indicated. So we find that also from there that no matter how small, how low the dose may be, it can also have an impact on it, on the patient, or on the tissue of a of woman. Now, talking about uh, patient dosimetry, it is important that patient dose are being measured because that's the only way they can know the impact and the exposure to the tissue and to organ that are exposed in the process. It's also through this process that um, they will have a good understanding of the technique, talking about the equipment itself, how it is uh, functioning very well, and also on how to be able, able to even make sure that the technologies and the, radiograph uh, the radiological staff are also doing the needful. Because we find that, that when we talk of patient dosimetry, there's a, a, a wide dose gap and dose variability with respect to dose. For the same, for example, a chest x-ray conducted by different uh, radiographer, they will have a different dose delivered to the patient. And in some cases, this variability, the range can be as far as uh, a difference of 100. We are going to, going to see some of them when I'll be showing some of the results I got from my research. It can be as high as that. And that is why it is important that over time, this uh, patient measurement is being conducted to ensure that uh, the doses delivered to the patient are low and the exposure is uh, minimal. Like I said earlier on, it's a tradition in most developed country to conduct a patient dose audit and to carry out a survey to ensure that on a regular basis, this dose is being uh, monitored in order to put other um, factors to the PRS minimum. So a measurement of patient dose it's a good strategy for radiation protection of the patient. But without it, the exposure will not be able to not be able to know the exposure. These are some of them. Uh, what happened when radiation uh, those uh, measurements are being conducted? For example, in a single X-ray room. They need to measure the dose and compare with those reference level. I'll talk about the dose reference level later as in this study. Now, when we talk about the dose reference level, the diagnostic reference level is a way of harmonizing the radiation dose of maybe a nation, a region, and so on. We have 
look at those reference, uh, the abuse reference level. We have it on a national level, we have it on a regional level, and so on and so forth. And the concept of diagnosis reference level was introduced by the International Commission on Radiological Protection in 1996. And it is established using the 75 percentile value. What do I mean by that? After all the patient, um, sorry, I'm sorry about that. For example, after the patient uh, dose has been measured, for example, in a hospital where we have a four x-ray facility, now all the x-ray room, all the um, patient dose will be collected and uh, analyzed. And then the, in the process, the median value of all the dose generated, maybe from all the hospital in a particular country, will now be collected, filtered. When I mean filtered, all the art layers will be removed. And that is why, unlike before, where we make use of uh, the mean, this day for development of those restaurant level is the median value that is being used. And then at the end, it will be compared with the diagnostic reference level. And before that is done, any, I'm sorry, I'm using the touch screen, that's why the vision is moving. Any patient dose that is going to be used for in the computation of diagnostic reference level, must be of a very high quality. If it is not of a high quality, it will not be used. So all those um, factors must be put into play. There are so many, but because of my time, I'm trying to make sure I finish everything I have here before it can be used to compute the diagnostic uh, reference level. So actually the, the diagnostic uh, reference level is just a way of, of harmonizing the radiation dose delivered to patients in a region. It could be on a national basis. It could be on a state basis. It could even be for a particular hospital. It depending as the case may be. And literature has made us to know that working with this, um, those reference, diagnostic reference level is a good way to promote uh, the good practice and enhance uh, radiation protection. And the wide dose variability that I make mention of the other time, but we find out that the dose variability that we are talking about, talking about the dose that is delivered to patients, does not only vary from one operator to the other, but it also varies from one hospital to the other and from one nation to another. And in the process, for that to, for us to be able to harmonize that, to reduce that dose variability, is the concept of what the diagnosis reference level is all about. So for my PhD research, like I said earlier on, I only work on a, I did a, develop a diagnosis reference level for the south uh, part of Nigeria. Nigeria is a very large nation, about 200 million people, and we have about six uh, geopolitical zones. So I work only on one of the geopolitical zones for my PhD research, and that is a uh, southwest Nigeria. These are some of the data I generated from my, from my research. These are just summary of what I did. For radiography examination, these are some of the, the diagnosis ref reference level I generated. For chest, uh, P, uh, for chest PA, for this is cervical, CS there is cervical spine, the cervical spine AP, I have 1.9, and then the corresponding effective dose is what we can see here. Now, I want us to look at this. If you look at this table, we'll find that, and that's why we are talking about the dose variability and the importance of diagnostic reference level. This is from chest um, x-ray, chest radiograph. For the same, type of examination, 
we can get a low, a dose as low as 0.68 milligram. And we can also have the one as high as 1.61 1 or 1.69 milligram for the same type of examination. And that is the dose variability we're talking about. And we find out that, that the higher the dose, the also the higher the one that the dose that will also be delivered to the different um, organs that is close to the area of exposure. For example, for chest x-ray, if a, a patient receives a dose of 1.2, the dose that will be delivered to the heart is about 0.5 milligram. The one that will be delivered to the kidney is about 0.24. The one that will be delivered to the liver is about 0.6. And the one that will be delivered to the lung is about 0.48. As you know that most time when we take the chest x-ray, is the lung that is uh, very close, that is mostly exposed. Now, by the time we look at the same chest x-ray, that is about 1.6 now, can we see the difference? This is about 1.29 that is delivered to the lung. Meanwhile, another, the same chest x-ray can give a dose of about 0 0.4. So why must this happen? And that is why the importance of the diagnosis reference level, that in order to, work, to enhance the radiation protection of a patient. There is, it is through the use of diagnosis reference level that this dose variability can be minimized. This is just for radiography examination. Now, this is for computer tomography examination. This I'm only showing for the a CTDI, that is a computer democratic dose index. Now for CT head, we have about 54 milligram, and then this is the corresponding uh, dose length product. The DIP there is dose length product, and this is size specific dose estimate. It's about 52 milligram, and effective dose associated with it is 3.01. Now when we get to abdomen, Abdomen, the CTDI is about 20.4, while the effective dose is about 20.58. We can see that unlike in radiography, where look at the effective dose associated with radiography examination. And we can see here, even for the extremity, that is why most times the extremity, they are negligible, they are not considered. We are talking about the glucose reference level. Why God decided to put this one here, just to let us know that this dose can be as low as that. We can see the effective dose is low, but when you're looking at um, computer tomography, the dose can be quite high. And that means the impact, the exposure to will also be very, very high. And that is part of why we are talking about radiation protection, because it's not all the X-ray imaging procedure that is low. Some of them can be high, especially when it comes to CT examination and some, uh, and some uh, fluoroscopy procedure too. The dose associated with them can be very, very high. Now, these are all from my results, my page, some of the results I obtained from my page. I just started to show us there just to know the importance of the diagnostic uh, reference level and the radiation protection of patients that we are, uh, the lecture is all about. I compare this with uh, some studies in literature. And this is the result I generated from my, my study. This is just a sample of it. And we can see here that uh, the dose from my, my study is a bit high compared to others. And there are several reasons for that. One of the one I can even I can talk about here is the quality control and the quality assurance. A literature has shown, and even from my study, that most um, diagnostic centers in developing country does not uh, have a comprehensive quality control assurance program. And because of that, it leads to, because when the equipment is not functioning very well, there is tendency for the dose associated with it to be high. Although there are several um, factors and several parameters that is responsible for that, but that's one of the key factors that is responsible 
when is a comprehensive quality control and quality assurance is not being conducted, the tendency to have a high dose is envisaged. Also, if most of these studies are from developed country, and uh, like I said earlier, it is a tradition there to conduct a patient survey on a periodic basis. But that is not uh, the case in developing country. For example, I can use my country as a, a case study. That is not being done. For example, even up to now, a diagnostic reference level, Nigeria as a country does not have a, a diagnostic reference level for now. Although they are working on it, but for now, it is not available. So, but if you look at most of these other countries, the diagnostic reference is not something that it will just be conducted and it will be left, no, but it is being updated periodically. For example, maybe in the, in the UK and so on, some on a five-year basis, they will work on it, carry out another survey in order to make sure that this uh, diagnostic reference level is being updated. And this will also ensure quality because every other factor too that is responsible for that will also be checkmate in the process. So that's a major, one of the major reasons that's responsible for the high dose we can see here. And that's the importance of uh, my study to make sure that this can be what? The impl implementation of the abuse reference level can be uh, made in Nigeria. Now, these are some of the uh, reports. Like I said, it's not only in Nigeria or in Africa that we talk about. It's a global view, it's a global kind. Someone we talk of radiation protection. This is a effective dose from a selected procedure from a, in, uh, some of European countries that we have here. And we can see the variability. For example, look at the, the computer tomography in green. You can see it varies from one country to the other. The same thing too have, applies to all the other imaging modality. So the, the patient dose variability varies from patient, uh, varies from um, one operator to the other. When I mean operator, as in the radiographers, from one operator to the other, from one um imaging room to another, from one hospital to another, from one country to another. And a good example is what we are seeing here. There is a, 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 a wide dose gap. Why some country are having a very low dose in some other country, it can be very, very high. Although there are several factors responsible for that, but it's part of why we are talking about the diagnostic reference level so that each country, each region could compare the, patient, the dose with diagnosis reference level to ensure that uh, the dose that is delivered to patients, it is minimal and the exposure is low. This also another one from uh, UK. This is exactly what I'm talking about. You can see their own review. This is one that was conducted in the middle 1980. After a five years, another review was conducted and Another one in 2000, another one in 2005, another one in 2010. Actually, for this, uh, my lecture, I did not put the current one they have, but that just to tell us how it is being updated. And we can see from here, from this table, initially, for example, when you talk of uh, Abdul Meher, initially in 1980, it was 10. After a thorough survey and update, it resists to seven. And we can see the gradual reduction. And the one I have here, we are having what, 4.4. And that is quite uh, appreciated from 10 milligrams uh, to 4.4. And that is important, the essence, what we're talking about uh, the aggressive reference level and the protection of patients from uh, diagnostic uh, radiology. Now, this one is from the United States. We can also see their diagnostic reference level. And apart from even the diagnostic reference level, they have another, um, another uh, dose, dose reduction strategy, which they call the achievable dose. And the achievable dose is simply talking about 
the 50 percent of the dose generated from all the hospital or if it's a region from all the region or from the country and the essence of that is that, that it is possible that this is achievable that means 50 percent of all the hospitals or all the imaging that was used have this value that is what the achievable dose is all about and if 50 percent of them can have it that means it is possible for all the other unlike in diagnostic reflex level i said earlier on, it is at the 75 percent, that is the third quartile. But when we talk of the achievable dose, it means 50 percent of all the imaging um, of all the hospital used have this uh, dose as their average. So these are some of the importance of a diagnostic reference level and as a way of a ensuring low exposure of patients to the harmful effect of a x-ray. Thank you for listening. And I want to appreciate everyone that was in a attendance for this study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justina. So do we have any questions? This was a very comprehensive talk. Thanks a lot. Huh? So do we have any questions in the audience? Huh? So nobody uh, there asking. Huh? So just by the time yeah, you try to, to think on some question, because I think it's maybe potentially different as well from your research or your the topic of expertise, but that's uh, that's quite interesting. I see maybe to, to look at uh, the problematic as well that you had with other eyes. So you were speaking, Francis, about the, the quality check and the quality assurance. So this is something which is really important. So you try to combine the numbers as well, so all the physics huh, with uh, this quality assurance to validate those methods for medical and the good health as well that people could have. So this is something which is very important as well to implement. So you were looking at the different legislation as well. So what you were following is mainly for the WHO and for the AER. So that's also really pertinent and important. And then from your study, so what would be um, the different uh, things, so take away that uh, hospital could implement, for instance, uh, in Nigeria. Did you communicate uh, with them or are you intending to try to help them with different development to improve the doses uh, that uh, they can um, distribute or that they could limit uh, to the patient? Can I answer now? Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now, from my, it is quite a uh, uh, broad, so I just have to summarize. I just show a little of what I did. But talking about the about the results, like before you can conduct such an examination, you have to have an ethical clearance from each of the hospitals you, you are going to be using. So one of the condition that was given to me is that after the study, I'm going to give a seminar to them on my results, mm -hmm. on my results, so that they'll be able to checkmate and see how to improve on their procedures. So, and I was able to do that in some of the hospitals. So you did? Yes, in, in some of the hospitals, yes. After the, after the, after the, my research in the hospital, I did make a presentation to them of my findings. Very good. So that they're able to know what to uh, work on. Then apart from that too, um, it, it has been, I've published some of them, even um, the uh, Confrontation Protection Conference of IA in 2019, I, it was, I published it, so it is there. It was published of the, um, what is it called? The result I got from my study was published, was there, was, was part of, I submitted for the conference there. 
So it was an avenue for them to know. And apart from that too, one of my supervisors is part of the people monitoring a couple in charge of a, um, medical physics in Nigeria, coordinating medical physics in Nigeria, the program of medical physics in Nigeria. So he's uh, aware of uh, my result. And so many other uh, results to have been conducted in other geopolitical zone so that all this can be harmonized. Then we can have a diagnosis reference level for the country. So is, uh, is one of your former supervisor or colleague connected to the meeting today? Justina? I don't think so. OK. Just, we just want to acknowledge uh, him or her if, uh, if the person is in the audience. For well, one of my supervisors is uh, ASP alumnus. I think he attended the uh, ASP in South Africa in 2010. Uh, what's oh. your name? Um, Moji Sukalu. OK. He's a professor. She's a professor now. Very good. Um, okay, so I have to disconnect now for another engagement. Sorry about that. Uh, but thank you very much, Justina. This was uh, fantastic. But you guys continue the discussion. Christine is here and she will uh, carry on with you. Thank you very much. Bye, Kitabi. Thank you. So we have indeed, so Marco, I don't know, you, he had to leave for the university, but I see that he's still connected. Marco, are you still there? Yeah, but I have to, I have to leave. Uh, I had to leave because I had to catch a train to to the university. But anyhow, thank you for the uh, for the uh, talk. Uh, actually, interesting because I mean it's not really my domain of work. I mean, I'm so uh, <clears throat> I'm always interested to learn about uh, you know reference those in a domain which I, I'm not active because diagnostic is not my my field of work. But it's, uh, it was was very interesting. So thank you for the for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And I think it would be interesting indeed to potentially as well check with uh, if even if radio protection, as uh, Marco said, it may be not for the application or for the hospital. At CERN as well, there is a lot of course of radiation and uh, and a lot of uh, doses that you want to to limit uh, on every workers. So there are as well the following of uh, the the IAEA and all the different legislation that have to be implemented. So we could look at that to 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 make sure. Okay, very good. So that's I think it's uh, it's really it's really complete. So do we have more questions or are there anything? Maybe Fatima. So did you had any kind of collection or collection as well from your studies that could potentially be as well um, giving you some more ideas as well in your studies? I see that you are connected, Fatima. But maybe you cannot speak. Uh, that's always the difficulties. Okay. I think there's a question on the chat. In the chat box. Yes, very good. So, so is there any uh, relationship between the effective doses and uh, the equivalent doses in terms of the radiotherapy? Like I said, my study. I'm looking at radio diagnostic. My work is mainly diagnostic, not radio therapy. So this is what <laughs> Yes, I'm talking about, but when you talk of effective dose, in radio therapy, the dose used is higher than what you find in diagnostic, is higher. So that means effective dose will also be higher and the impact is more because of the high dose that is associated with it. Or diagnostic, the dose is quite low compared to radiotherapy. Well, my study is just mainly diagnostic, not radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. And is there any potential uh, interest as well that you have or that other people in the university could uh, complement as well for connecting as well to the radiotherapy? Mm, actually, my... My investee for now, they are not having, though we have diagnostic equipment, some, but our, we don't have a college of medicine. So we are not really operating that now. So maybe, but maybe in the future, we can look at that. 
But for now, my institution does not have a, a medical school. Okay. So but the, we have an hospital where we have some medical uh, diagnostic equipment that we are using, but not therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And did you look at um, the influence of the different parameters, for instance, uh, that would uh, change or modify the result? Like yeah, there are so many of them. There are so many parameters, but I was unable to show them here because of uh, this thing. There are so many parameters that we can look at that we, that we take note of, especially the when we talk of the technical, we call it then the the technical factors. Technical factors. Talk, talking about the um, the voltage from the uh, X-ray machine, the voltage, the the MAS, the kilovolts, and so on. There are several parameters that, but I did not mention them here. Mm -hmm. And all those two on two is part of what I presented when I was doing some of the seminar in the hospital to see because we find out that because some of them did not conduct a, a comprehensive quality assurance uh, program and they didn't do periodic quality control of their equipment, we find out that. Some what the the machine is generating, the dose that machine is generating is quite different from the selected. Those are some of the results I got from my study. So, but I didn't show it here. This is just a summary, just talking about it there, but there are several other factors that was generated. Yeah. Yeah. Minus, huh? potentially quite a, a large error as well, depending on those diagnostic. But depending as well on the parameter, the environment could be from the temperature, from the humidity as well, or any kind of other parameters. So, so that's interesting. This is very important to have all of that captures as well in, uh, in this uh, parameters, because then when you do the quality control, so then you define the procedure for sure, but then the quality control is as well, when you make the measurement, you will make a measurement against this reference. And this reference has to be as well level in some way that is uh, as well realistic. And then it would be non not conformance with uh, this uh, reference if uh, then you, you, you have a, a good quality control uh, and a good quality insurance process. And I want to say that before uh, you can um, select um, the um, patient dose I'm going to use for that use reference, it has to go through some protocols before that can be, like I said, the image quality, the image quality is only a uh, image, the image of uh, the image that of a high quality and standard that are used. It's not all the patients, and um, it's not the dose or the image that are used. It's only those that of high quality and of standard that are used in, a, in, mm -hmm. a, in the development of diagnostic uh, reference level. So there are so many protocols that one need to follow before that can be achieved. It's not as if you just get the patient dose and mention, no, it's not, it doesn't work that way. There are several other parameters, protocol that need to be put in place before that, uh, before you can get to that level. For example, you have to know the frequency. For example, it's not all the examination that you can generate a technical reference level. You must have appreciable number of patient dose from each uh, equipment that you are making use of. And then over a range of uh, the area or the region you are looking at. And then it must be of a high quality. And then before you can even do that, the quality control of the equipment must be conducted in the process before so it's a lot, it's the protocol are much. All those protocols must be addressed before you can get to the level of uh, getting the uh, diagnostic reference level. So it's a bit of a background if you think about uh, the, the high energy physics, for instance. You want to make sure that you define well how to measure the background, and then you have to remove it so that you can really get uh, the, the data that you then implement in your, your quality insurance. So it, it's kind of an interesting analysis. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then for, for also my study, it was I, I employed two methods for my study for me to be able to get my testing. Although this one I didn't mention it yet, because since I was not really talking about my PhD research, so that's why I didn't uh, mention them. But I make use of two measures so that in able to to be able to find what if a better option. For example, I use a, a TLD, which is a millimeter dosimeter to measure the patient dose. I also make use of a, a mathematical model 
to measure the patient dose. So which I did and at the end I was able to compare to see uh, the difference. And when you are looking at the mathematical, it's simply based on the, the machine parameter, the equipment parameter. So all those ones was also put in place before I got to the stage of uh, developing the diagnosis. But just because I'm not specifically talking about my PhD research, that's why I didn't put all that into the lecture. So it gives us <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. So there was was it any question? Maybe not. Yeah. So the so I think it's it's really it's really nice as well to see the the quantity as well. Uh, I mean, and the data. How did you store all the data? Or was it like large quantity, or did you process everything from your own computer? Or did you add some kind of uh, additional tools, or did you use the cloud? It's not maybe large quantity, but still, it's a model. Yeah. Um. Actually, my uh, I would like my data was not that too large. It was not too large that my yeah, but I stored it on the cloud. Actually, I did. But it was not too large, and the and the reason was because um, uh, maybe I didn't show it in Nigeria presently. We have about from the recent uh, research about three thousand radiography machines, for example, for a population of about two million. So you can you can see the the comparison is very very low. So we don't have a appreciable number of imaging equipment. That's one of the limitations of the, uh, I mean, my study. We didn't have appreciable number of equipment that the data can get to be so that large. And also in the process, there are so many um, hospitals we get to that the equipment are down. So I, I will not make use of them and so on. So my data was not that too large that I could not use. But I have other um, software that I use. For example, for my, Patient dose, dose delivered to different organ, organ dose. I use the Pixie SMC, mm -hmm. personal computer, um, X ray Matcalo simulation software. That was what I used for the analysis of my software. Then for my quality control, I use a, a quality control kit from IBA in Germany. That was the quality control kit I used for my radiography machine. So all those, uh, this thing was uh, put in place. So but my data was not too large that my this thing cannot contain. But part of it was stored in the cloud and then I use my computer okay. my laptop. Not too large and the quality was something already existing. So you took an existing uh, um, process. No, well. for, for this research, and that's what part of the delay I had in my research. Yeah. I have to, my institution has to buy the quality control kits. So you so that was for the institution, okay. But the German uh, part so was something that were kind of flexible, so that you could uh, organize it the way you wanted to build up your own uh, aspect uh, of the quality control. Mara, that's why. Yes, yes. But for but, but not all the machine. The quality control bots is just for the radiography machine. Mm -hmm. For the machine, okay. Yes, but not for other. Uh, Equipment like a computer because computer generally will come with its own phantom for the uh, uh, quality control. But the, the mm -hmm. one I bought, the one my institution bought that I use for the study, I mainly use it for the radiography equipment and then for mammoth mammography machines. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So there would be some uh, hopefully follow up as well on that. Huh? So do we have uh, more comment otherwise? Huh? If it's not question, because I think it's a, a very good presentation. So we will um, certainly as well follow up on, uh, on you because it's uh, nice as well to see that since 2014 as well. So you managed to do all this work. Huh? So do you have any plan as well for the, the future? What is uh, your ambition? Yes, I did say that I'm um, hoping to do my to go for a postdoc, so I'm still working on that. To go for my postdoc, and if I have the opportunity to to know more about, because like I said, because I have interest, I want to be a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. That was why I have interest in medical physics. Mm -hmm. I decided to read my research in doctor's So 
if I am planning to work more on that area. Okay, then. Okay. And your thesis is in English or in uh, which language? Is it, uh, it's all written in English, your thesis? Yes. So then I'd like a copy, please. <laughs> would be nice. Or no. if it's in, uh, in electronic format, so that would be good because we, we should actually store the, all of them. And if uh, some of uh, your colleague here has as well, so we would be happy to, to receive them and then we can collect everything. We will soon have a new website as well that we're working on. So kind of library like this could be as well showing, for instance, all the, the work that you did. So that, that would be very valuable. And that way it could be as well a way for you to have visibility and to, to, to show your work to the rest of the world. Huh? Yeah, very good. So if there is no more questions, so maybe we can uh, stop here. And uh, thank you again a lot, Justina. Very, very good uh, work. And in a nice place like this, so there's no problem huh, to work all day long. Because you know that at the end of the day, so you can rest and swim a bit in the in the river or in the, so I guess it's the sea. Mm. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, so thank you everybody. And then we will, uh, so hopefully see all of you as well next uh, Tuesday. So we'll go on like this, uh, listening to different uh, experience and with different topics as well. And this is what I think is really good in a nutshell to, to review all those different uh, themes and, 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 and ideas that uh, have been injected. And potentially we could as well from what you are presenting get as well some uh, way to improve uh, the, the coming uh, presentation. And, and you've seen we have online as well the earlier presentation that were given. So I just put as well a link that shows the, the different presentation in a different uh, by topic. So that could be maybe easier as well for you. And medical application were quite, um, I mean, oh, and radiation was one of the topics. So there are several presentations there where everybody can uh, learn more. Very good. So thank you, everybody. And uh, have a nice evening. Thank you, Justina. Thank you. Bye. Bye.